My name is Eric Cooper. I'm an African American. I grew up in a country that I love. And when I was asked to come to give the TED Talk today, I came gladly primarily because it's the 145th birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. Why that is so special for, for me should be obvious. I'm a black American. It is because of Gandhi that our country was changed. He lifted up leaders from the 1930s through to Martin Luther King and many others. He lifted up a world because it was the civil rights movement that opened up hearts and minds to fight against racism, stereotypes, putting people into various categories. He lifted up another nation, South Africa, a shirt that I proudly wear today for this honor, where he lived for a while, which led to Nelson Mandela and reconciliation. My speech today, my TED Talk, is called The Power of Belief, Social Demography is Not Destiny. And I want to start with my own personal narrative of who I am and where I grew up to make a point to share an idea that I feel is given too short shrift in this world today. As I travel around the world and give speeches to large audiences, I'm often lifted up by the hope and the renewed belief that I feel. I'm an educator. I'm a dad. I'm someone who believes in the capacity of all people. I'm someone who believes that every single one of us has a unique talent. And my journey my life journey began in Peekskill, New York. Peekskill, New York is a little town northeast of New York City, about 38 miles. When I was a child, I used to run down Divin Street, tagging my little brother along with me. He could hardly keep up. Run down to Oakside Elementary School, where it's part of a school community that many people believed, many of the teachers believed, in the children that they served. But there were some that did not. I can remember a reading teacher. She was a wonderful teacher. She, she had this idea that you need to categorize and separate kids in terms of reading levels. There were the Robins, who were sort of like in between. There was the Baltimore Orioles, who were the high achievers. That was her favorite bird. And then there were the Blackbirds. That was my category. Then there were the buzzards. That was some children, sadly, who could not read it at all. Peekskill also was known for its racial riots in 1949, where Paul Robeson, the great African-American athlete and singer, met with the wonderful, wonderful activist and folk singer Pete Seeger in a place where my family used to take us to the Hollybrook Drive-In Theater, where during that time, these people marched, the KKK, or Ku Klux Klan. Now, I had friends whose fathers marched under those sheets who were arguing against equal rights and equal opportunity for all people, in particular, African Americans. Peekskill, where the police and people at the Hollybrook Theater turned against African Americans and the people who were there. Peekskill, New York, a place where racism was alive, but a place where people also wanted to see change. There were many progressives there. There were many people who really believed in all kids. I, I might have been in the Blackbirds. <laughs> it always cracks me up because of the affiliation that I feel to that bird. But I also was somebody where a guidance counselor did not believe in my ability to succeed. She tried to convince my mother and father that I could never do well in college and university. I graduated from high school. My SAT scores were lousy. My Q GPA was about a 72. I barely got out of high school. I tried to get into many different colleges and universities, but I could not. And the only place that accepted me was a place called Dutchess Community College in Poughkeepsie, New York, upstate a few miles from where I lived in Peekskill. I got into the school my first semester, and now students, I'm talking to you. My first semester, I got a .80 out of four. I failed almost every single one of my courses, except for band, where I did very well. I got a B. 
because of my grades and because of my behavior, I got kicked out of Dutchess Community College, along with several other friends. When my mother heard that I got kicked out, she cried as my father did. My mother always would run into this town in Peekskill, into the guidance council, and the guidance council would ask my mother, how was Eric doing? When I first got into a school, she said proudly, proudly he got into a two-year school. When, when, when I got kicked out, she walked across the street to avoid her. Because you always run into people in Peekskill, New York. Peekskill, New York, and my guidance counselor. My father arguing for me, and a teacher, a biology teacher who happened to be my wrestling coach, argued to get me back into the school through the dean. And he said to the dean, I reiterate, Eric has the capacity to succeeding in higher education. I heard that word, reiterate. <laughs> That's a beautiful word. I didn't know what it meant. But I heard the word, and I thought it was beautiful. I went back to a dictionary, and I found out what it was. There began my love for vocabulary. There began my interest to explore education to its fullest. Because a teacher believed in me, who just happened to be white, Mr. Barnett. He believed in this African-American, this child who grew up in a family that was struggling with poverty. He believed in my ability to use my mind in a way that I could see a pathway to a better future. I left Dutchess Com Community College after five semesters, how long it took me, and I went to a place called the Universidad de las Americas in the Ciudad de Mexico. Cuando yo puedo hablar en español, I learned how to speak Spanish. I studied with some of the giants, Eric Fromm and Ivan Ilyich. And I could not wait till my mother ran into that guidance counselor. And my mother did. And when my mother met her, the question came out, how's Eric doing? She was interested in me, you see. And my mother told her I got into a school outside the country, and she turned, the guidance counselor turned to a friend and said, well, anybody can get into a, into a university outside the country. Now, at this point, you've got to understand that this guidance counselor is starting to motivate me to succeed. I absolutely had to show her wrong. So I left the University of the Las Americas, University of the Americas, in a year, and I enrolled in the City University of New York, Richmond College at the time. I got a BA in psychology, I graduated, and I asked my mother this particular question. Where did this guidance counselor get her master's? Because I knew she had a master's. My mother said, Columbia University's Teachers College. And I said, Mom, that's where I'm going. She said, why? <laughs> why don't you pick something, something else that's an easier school? I said, I'm going there because I have something to prove. One Saturday, I had to take something called the Miller Analogies Test, the MAT. Saturday in New York City, 21-year-old. Can you imagine? You get the story on a Saturday. First question I got on this Miller Analogies Test, crewing is to the Charles as boating is to. I know friend, my friend's name, Charles. Crewing must meet a crew cut. I got the worst exam, I think, in the history of Columbia University in terms of the Miller Analogies test. But something happened. I ran into a teacher, a professor. His name was Frizziani, who just happened to be an Italian-American. And I ran into a woman. Her name was Dorothy Strickland, who just happened to be a professor who was African-American. They believed in me. They lifted me up. They got me to rethink my ability. You see, I was struggling against the stereotypes that were projected onto me because I had grown up in poverty and I was black. I was struggling against the, the need to feel accepted within my community. I was struggling against the stereotypes that would keep me down because of how I looked. In spite of the fact that a friend said to me one day, one of the... One of the kids of the parent who was marching around in those sheets, racist. He said to me, Peter said to me one day, he said, Eric was good to, God was good to Eric because he had a little white paint left over for him. I cried that time when he told me because I was crying for my darker relatives and those who I believe in. I'm at Columbia University now. I'm beginning to believe in myself. And I run into the hallways of a cognitive psychologist named Reuben Feuerstein. Now this is important. 
I met him in those halls, those august halls of Columbia University. And Reuven taught me, taught me in a class one time, that no one knows the capacity of a child. No one, maybe except God. Reuven talked to me about his work with kids who were born with Down syndrome, you know, borderline. One of his students had a reported IQ of 72 who had Down syndrome. She worked with Reuven for three years in his methodology. She graduated with a PhD and is now a practicing clinical psychologist. Reuven did one other thing. He hired plastic surgeons to change the look of some of his Down syndrome kids. Every single child and parents had accepted that plastic surgery where he found a funding, where he was able to change their look. Out distance succeeded those who did not have that. You see, we project belief from what we see. I graduated got my master's, got a second master's, and then I asked my mother, did that guidance counselor ever get a doctorate? And my mother said, no. I said, well, I am going to get it. My mother pleaded with me not to go that far. You're so, you've done so well, Eric. I got that doctorate because professors who believed in me, and I did very well. When I graduated, I could not wait till my mother ran into that guidance counselor. And she did, because this is Peekskill, New York, a little town. And she asked the question that she always asked when she saw my mother. How is Eric doing? My mother said proudly, all in her five foot one frame, looked her in the eye as best she could and said, my son is the first one in my family to get a doctorate. And you know what the guidance counselor said? I always knew Eric had it in him. <laughs> the brain, the mind. We now know from neuroscience that there's approximately 86 billion neurons up here. 16 billion neurons is what separate us from other primates, which is primarily in the cerebral cortex. In the human mind, in a lifetime, approximately 100 trillion neural connections can be made. To me, that's exciting, because I'm told, I've read, I've heard, that that's more particles than the particles in the universe. We take in approximately 11 million data sets every single minute from our visual cortex, our auditory co cortex, and our somatosensory cortex. 11 million. That's in one minute. The point of this is to say belief is really critical in terms of how we are able to get children, students on the right pathway. Belief was critical for me. I had to change my belief. I had to begin to rethink that I have control, cognitive control of my own mind through the effort and the resilience and the work I put into a sustained effort. Andres Erickson's research says it takes about 10,000 hours of sustained deliberative practice to become an expert in a field. That's about a year and a half or a little more. Belief, importantly, animates what is called hope. I want to spend a little time about hope because we always talk about it. You pick up the paper on, on TV or in the media. Everybody is talking about we need to be more hopeful. We need to be more hopeful about the world, no matter the challenges and the struggles that we go through. Hope. Hope. It's critical. The two primary components of hope are belief and expectations. If we deny belief and expectations for all children who are born under God's eye with the unique talent and gift that just needs to be embraced and led and developed and nourished, we are failing in that sustainability that we know is necessary in terms of deepening human capital. Those children with their arms up in the air, African-American children, some of who I met in South Africa, some of who I see in the ghettos of Detroit. I know what can be for all of those children. Hope. Hope. I know how important hope is to our health as organisms walking on this earth. Hope. Jerome Grootman of Harvard has taught us through a wonderful book called The Anatomy of Hope that there's an authentic biology to hope. Hope. 
If a child or an individual is taught to be hopeful, that person is healthy. Rootman found with, in medical research at Harvard with his patients that were suffering from cancer that if you were able to help them become more hopeful, that the brain emits something called endorphins and encephalins, which have analgesic qualities, which can help the organism grow more healthy. And he found that those patients who were taught to be more hopeful developed and lived longer lasting lives. Hope. Hope that comes from that embrace. Because you know what happens with that embrace? Do you know what happens with that embrace? Eight hugs a day. Fist bumping. I walked into the school today and I was fist bumping every single student I met. High-fiving them, giving them a hug when it was appropriate. Because when you are hugging, when you are developing a trusting relationship with a fellow human being, you're enabling that individual to release the neurotransmitter that's called oxytocins, which are produced by the hypothalamus, which are a neurotransmitter that helps us create trusting relationships. It's called the trust molecule, the relationship molecule, or the love molecule, or the God molecule. Oxytocins, neural, neuroscience is teaching us so much about what can be. So hug your children. That neuron, those 86 billion neurons, are firing all the time. What we need to do is enable them through a new definition of intelligence, which is so critical. Intelligence is not just what you know, but what you do when you don't know what to do. It's how you're able to bridge that gap between the known and the unknown. It's a recognition that, that in terms of within each race, that prior knowledge is the most important predictor of success. If students are denied exposure so that prior knowledge is developed, even though they're taking in 11 million you know, data sets every minute, if we deny them and stereotype them and say, well, you are not capable because you are struggling with poverty or you're not white, we will not sustain this world. Hope. Socrates. Socrates. By the way, he was taught by African philosophers before him. He learned from them. So the African philosophers predated Socrates. But Socrates said something really critical. Socrates said that education should be about unleashing, uncovering, enabling, pulling out, the drawing out of knowledge that's already there within the individual. It's important when a leader, a teacher, acts as a mentor with the child. It's important because children become animated by the hope, the belief that is being generated. It's important because we begin to understand that that hope, which Aristotle, a student of Plato, called hope is that awakening dream. It's important to know that within each race, it is only prior knowledge. So what we do to provide the exposure for kids is more important. And it's not just a knowledge base that's important. It is a deep understanding, as Plato said, that knowledge is a continuous rediscovery of our own insights. If that is true, and I believe it is true, then we, as educators, as parents, as nations, must begin to uncover that human capacity that exists within all of us. Within all of us. There's a great quote that I'll end with because it captures it. It captures it for me. We should think of our children as wildflower seeds in an unmarked package. We can't know what will emerge. All we can do is plant them in fertile soil, give them plenty of water and sunlight, and wait patiently to see the uniqueness of their beauty. And that quote was from Wendy Mogul, a, clinic, a renowned clinical psychologist. The point of my speech has been the following, and it's an idea that I think should be spread, because too often, in this world, in pockets that exist in a school community. Children are being relegated not to develop their unique talent, but to fit a category that we as adults have created for them. Let us stop at this moment, learning from neuroscience, and decide that we are the future for those children, and they are the future for us. And that is an idea, I think, that is worth sharing with the world. Thank you very much.